week ago, last Saturday, I was sharing with the folks in our Back to the Basics of the Bible Summer Series the benefits of being a member of a Christian congregation, one of which was enjoying the privilege of having a spiritual guide, a spiritual shepherd. I asked them if they knew what the word pastor means. It's Latin for shepherd. But we pastors don't do all the shepherding in this Christian congregation. According to our constitution and bylaws, the members of the church council shall serve as spiritual leaders of the congregation for the spiritual well-being and growth of all the members. The nine men who serve on the church council here at Grace Lutheran Church in downtown Milwaukee are also shepherds. Ask any parent what's involved in godly parenting and eventually they'll get around to describing responsibilities that sound an awful lot like what a shepherd does. Parents are shepherds of their little and not so little lambs in their family. In every Christian congregation, the Lord God has given to certain individuals the spiritual gift of shepherding, which is none other than the ability and the desire to and the concern for others, caring for them over a long-term space of time. Those people, too, are shepherds. But it's obvious that not all members of a Christian congregation are pastors, not all are on the church council, not all are parents, and not all are given the spiritual gift of shepherding. But today's second reading from the Apostle Peter's first letter, chapter 5, widens our view. This paragraph is, of course, primarily designed for spiritual leaders in a Christian congregation, but it's also true that God wants all of us to care about and care for others. In other words, God wants you to be a shepherd. Some time ago, I had a conversation with an elderly woman who it was rather obvious, would only be on this earth for another short time. I wanted to review with her Jesus' promises to take believers to heaven. And so I asked her, do you know for sure where, where you will end up when you die? Her response, harder funeral home. I hope they haven't changed it. Do you have an end goal in mind? You might think that's a dumb question. The answer is obvious, right? Our end goal is heaven. But just to make sure we're all on the same page, our end goal is not making money. It's not letting our hair down on the weekend. It's not seeing how many ways we can fool our parents into thinking we're behaving when we're not. It's not finding Miss Right or Mr. Right. It's not satisfying every sexual urge. Our end goal is not having kids. It is not reaching retirement and living on an island with low humidity, no bugs, temperatures between 75 and 80 every day, and my ties delivered whenever we want. No, that's not the end goal of life. Our end goal is to avoid the fire of hell and to enjoy the bliss and the beauty of heaven. But the question that troubles us most often is how do we cope with the down times in life before we reach the end goal? The Apostle Peter comes alongside of us today, puts his arm around us and says, I get it, I understand the challenge, I know that Satan is on the attack. Scroll down four verses from this portion of scripture and the Apostle writes, Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Are you doing okay? 
Can you make it on your own? I have to confess that when I try to go it on my own, I don't do too well. I struggle. And I bet you do too. Too often we fall off the path into the ditch on one side, the ditch of frustration and feelings of helplessness. This sinful thought keeps popping into my mind and jumping in and I can't stop it. Or we fall off the path into the ditch on the other side, the ditch of self-reliance. I can do it on my own. Leave me alone. I'm okay. I can make my own way. Only to be disappointed in ourselves for falling way short of what we want to be and do. And worse, falling short of what God wants us to be and do. What to do? Where to turn? We turn to the Lord Jesus, that great shepherd who steps into our world and into our life and guarantees that he has bought for us a ticket to ride, a ticket to ride all the way to heaven, bought not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood. Just don't lose it. The reason I say that is there are plenty of distractions in our world to divert our attention away from our end goal. And there are plenty of people who, either because of jealousy or because they don't understand or because they think they have their own ways to the end goal, which they think work but really don't, who are trying to steal our ticket to heaven or at least make us forget about it and leave it on the dresser. The one way to hold on to our end goal and the ticket to heaven that Jesus has given us, the one way to hold on to that is to have a spiritual shepherd. A shepherd who cares about who we are and what we do. We are so far removed from, in time from the shepherds of Jesus' day and so far removed in space from what farmers do in tending their sheep, but we tend to forget or don't understand what shepherds do. Basically, shepherds operate in three dimensions. They guide their sheep and lambs onto right paths, not pushing from behind, but leading from out in front. They take their lambs and sheep to quiet waters and green pastures for nourishing food. And they look out for bad guys and lions and tigers and bears. They protect the flock. In other words, shepherds lead, feed, and give heed. Don't you want that in your life? That's what God wants for you. And that's what he wanted for the apostle Peter. Take it for one who lived it, who knew where it was at. Peter, with the weaknesses of his life often showing up, with his bone-weary wandering away from the Lord. He needed a shepherd, and what a shepherd he had. He calls him the chief shepherd. Jesus steps into this world to lead, feed, and give heed for all of his lambs and sheep, and that included Peter, and he did it perfectly. And Peter's not just making this up. He said, I appeal to you as a witness of Christ's suffering. He himself was a personal witness of Christ's suffering and one who will share in the glory to be revealed to make sure that we get to enjoy all the blessings that our shepherd wants us to enjoy. He also provides for us others to be shepherds for us, under shepherds of the chief shepherd, parents, pastors, church leaders. And the Apostle Peter's language and phrases here indicate that they are the ones who look carefully over us, who watch out for us carefully, and we are comforted by the fact that they go about their shepherding with some experience under their belt. Want to be comfortable in who you are, in your identity? Look no farther than the chief shepherd who identifies you as his lamb, his sheep, his dear ones. Look no farther than his under-shepherds, who, like the Apostle Peter, come alongside, put their arms around our shoulder to lead, feed, and give heed for us. With their shepherding, you and I can say, 
I'm not going to be influenced by others, but I'm going to be an influence for others. I know who I am and what God has made me. I am one of his lambs. I'm also one of his under-shepherds. And I will shepherd the flock that he gives me, even if it's a classmate or just one friend or a family member or a neighbor. Who am I and what's my identity? You can say this. I am Jesus' little lamb. I am also an under-shepherd of the chief shepherd. That's what he has made me to be. A shepherd heard the blare of his alarm from the nightstand, slapped it off, and then rolled over to dig his head into the cool side of the pillow. But after a few minutes, his eyes blinked open and he realized, "Uh uh-oh, I better get up and get to the sheep pen because if I'm late, it'll be my head. The boss does not tolerate tardiness. And I can't afford to lose my job in this economy. A different shepherd heard his alarm blare from the nightstand. He slapped it off and then swung his legs out of bed with a smile and said, I can't wait to get to the sheep pen because I love working for my boss. He has entrusted me with his most precious lambs and because he is so generous to me with his time, his interest in me, and even his pay. Which would you rather be? Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. A shepherd finished his work one day and grumbled, muttered under his breath about the uncomfortable temperatures and the lousy, smelly working conditions. He cheated on his time sheet that he handed into his boss, hoping he could bilk his boss out of a couple extra bucks. A different shepherd, another shepherd, turned in his time sheet to his boss at the end of the day and walked away and then was surprised when he opened up his pay envelope. His heart started beating faster. His breath came in short pants as he looked in that envelope and saw ten sparklers. See notes, Benjamin Franklin's, ten $100 bills as a free gift undeserved from his boss. (laughs) Which would you rather be? Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, not pursuing dishonest game but eager to serve. The sheep heard the shepherd approaching and ran for cover because they sensed his overbearing, top-down, my way or the highway attitude. They were afraid of him. The sheep in another pen heard the voice of the shepherd and gladly ambled toward him because they knew that the shepherd's presence meant full tummies and safe passage. Which would you rather be? Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples of the flock. Since God wants all of his sheep to take on the dual role of being both lambs and also under shepherds, what attitude, what activity, what actions will we be involved in? Maybe another question precedes all of that. How can any of us ever do it? Even those of us who have the title of pastor as a full-time shepherd, even parents, even church council members, every single day get on our knees and have to call out, Lord, have mercy, I have failed so often. What to do? We go to the chief shepherd, who is not only chief, number one, top, in charge, but who's also the good shepherd. So good, so loving, so caring is he that he laid down his life for the sheep. And not just cute and cuddly little lambs, but for dirty, smelly, naughty, wandering sheep. And for little lambs who too often get caught in the brambles of stupid sin, who limp because of bones broken in the potholes of guilt, who too often fall into the pit of the same temptations day after day. 
These are the lambs and sheep that the good shepherd died for. He risked his life and died for lambs and sheep like that, for lambs and sheep like you and like me. And he's not dead and gone and far away, leaving us all alone. The Apostle Peter assures us he's very much alive. When the When Christ, the chief shepherd, appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. God wants you to be a shepherd. Knowing who our shepherd is and what he's done for us, who would not want to respond, sign me up, Lord? Sure enough, there are people right now here today who are or will be parents who shepherd the lambs and not so little lambs in their family just as they were shepherded bringing them to the font for the washing of baptism, helping them mature in faith to stand shoulder to shoulder with them for the Lord's body and blood in the special supper, and then eventually escorting them out so they can be shepherds of others as mature sheep in God's flock. There are young people here today who are considering whether they can devote their their lives to being a shepherd for little lambs in a Lutheran school. There are young people here today who might well consider being full-time shepherds to shepherd a congregation and one day maybe standing in this pulpit. But all of you, all of you, have been given by God a flock of at least a friend or one family member or a classmate or someone you know or a neighbor so that you can lead, feed, and give heed to that person because God wants you to be a shepherd. As courageous and and bold as the Apostle Peter was, he also got his feet wet in weak faith, and he also burned his fingers in the fire of fear. But what did the chief shepherd do for him? He picked up the Apostle Peter, dusted him off, and sent him out as an under-shepherd. And now the Apostle Peter conveys that same love and care of the shepherd to you and to me, because God wants you to be a shepherd, and you can, and you will, even if it's for a flock of one. Amen. And please stand.